Father in heaven, we count it a joy to be here in your presence again. We don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly. We don't take it presumptuously. But we want to sincerely ask today that you would cleanse our hearts, open our eyes, our minds, and our ears to your truth today. And as we take a look at this very important subject, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us, would lead us, would draw us, would direct us. We ask your blessing now. Be in our midst, more importantly, be in our hearts, comforting us where we need to be comforted, convicting us where we need to be convicted, but always drawing us toward Yourself. May we be one with You today, is our prayer in Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to jump right into it because we just don't have time to waste, but there's a couple of passages that I want to look at with you that I think are very strong, significant passages in the New Testament dealing directly with witchcraft you know in the early church this stuff was prevalent and in many places in the world today where we do christian missionary work we always have to continue to battle these things even in post 2000 you go to india you go to africa you go to many various places in asia there's animism still taking place there's ancestral worship taking place. I was in Malaysia just a few years ago and visited some of the local sites there. I was doing some, some uh, speaking appointments and, and I went to some of these little parks where they have these little uh, stands and people have pictures of their dead ancestors. And every day they'll bring little bowls of rice and all these types of things. So it, it, when we look back in uh, ancient times and biblical times, it's natural to think that all of these practices were happening way back then, but they're still very prominent today. In fact, many of the same things that were being done those days are being done in 2020, whatever the year is. I know what year it is, but for the recording, whatever year you may be watching this. So Acts chapter uh, 8, and we're going to take a look at this little passage. I'm not going to spend too much time on this passage but I think it's very powerful. If you would, just turn there with me. Acts chapter 8. All right. I should have been turning while I was talking, but I didn't do that. So we'll do it now. Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. The Bible says this, But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting that many times people uh, substitute, they, 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 this type of spiritualism is taking place, and they have this wrong idea that it is the power of who? God. Just like we talked about yesterday, people bringing in these various little things like spirit crystals or bounce bands or incense or whatever and they seriously think that it is god uh using the that, that because it's just a natural thing that it must be from god and god's power is in it friends that is pantheism when you believe that the power of god is in the inanimate things of nature and you can tap into that power to create some effect for yourself that is pantheism and romanticism and animism. There's various forms of it, but it all boils down to the same thing. God is the God of nature. He creates nature by His power, but He does not put His power in those things. Does that make sense? Those things are living. They have His power within them, but they're not things that we can tap into and utilize in a spiritual way for our benefit. Now, again, somebody asked me, well, what's the difference between the crystals and, say, natural remedies? Natural remedies typically are, are some type of plant or whatever that I can ingest, and my body uses the vitamins or whatever in that to bring healing to my body, rather than trying to tap into a spiritual power that is perceived to be in a thing to bring healing to me. Does that make sense? The only time that those, that kind of a power is used is when God directly does that healing Himself. You see that? He does not put His power in other things and then call you to tap into that power 
to do a thing for yourself. You understand the difference between like a natural remedy and something that we're perceiving has spiritual power. There's a vast difference between that. So it's very interesting that when people are blinded and when they are lack of understanding, they will perceive these types of things to be the power of who? The power of God. It's very mind-blowing that people do this. But you begin to, as you study the Word of God, begin to perceive the difference. Uh, let's go on, verse 11. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for how long? A long time. It's very interesting that when people experience something that is not of God, it might be an initial shock to them. But if you give people enough time, if you give that thing long enough, eventually the people will get used to it, eventually they will become accustomed to it, and then eventually they will become attached to it. Take the Sabbath, for instance. The Sabbath was established a few hundred years after Jesus left the earth, much to the objection to many Christians on the earth, but then over time, people got used to it, and then they became what? Attached to it. It happens all the time, and this is what happens. Even with some of the most dark things, the most dark practices, we can become accustomed to it, and not just even accustomed to it, but attached to it, and not even attached to it, but actually believing that what that thing is, is actually from God Himself. It's the human nature, fallen human nature. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And then Simon himself believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs <coughs> which were done. So, Simon was, cra uh, was trapped in sorcery. He heard Philip preaching and working genuine miracles from God. And what does the Bible say he did? What's the B word? He believed, and then he was baptized. So did Simon believe in Jesus, yes or no? Yes. His, you know, I don't know to what level his conversion was. The Bible doesn't indicate, but he believed in Jesus. So he became a believing, baptized, practicing follower of Jesus because of the preaching of Philip. Okay? How many of you believe in Jesus? How many of you are baptized? How many of you love to hear good biblical preaching? All right, let's keep reading. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they came down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as of yet they had, he had uh, fallen upon none of them, and they only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them what? Hmm saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with what? With money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of of God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God perhaps uh, that if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And then Simon answered and said, pray the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. Now it's very interesting that, you know, I'm not sure that Simon was fully converted. I don't, I don't know the depth of that, but he was, he did believe he was baptized, but he still had an interest in those things. And he wanted the power, not just for the sake of the blessing of others, but he wanted the power to enhance what? Himself. Do you see that? 
And then even when Peter calls him out, he says, your money perish with you, pray that the Lord would forgive you. He doesn't say, oh man, I was wrong. I was in a bad way. I was misled. I was deceived. But he says, pray that none of these things will come on me. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Like even after that, he's still not really repentant of the thing. He's just saying, I hope nothing bad happens to me because of this. So let me tell you, it's possible for us to believe. It's possible for us to be baptized. It's possible for us to enjoy coming to the good old Michigan camp meeting and still be involved in the things that are not of God's. And if you notice what Peter said, he said, you have no what? Part with the kingdom of God as long as you are hanging on to these things. Now listen, some people need to be educated. Some people need to, be, they need to grow in grace. Now what we don't do is if we hear of somebody that has some movie in their house, we go over and smack their hand and we just slap them around a little bit with Bible verses and beat them up and say, don't you know that this is of the devil? No, we're not doing those things, are we? Are we? No. But guess what? Some of you are, and some of you do. We need to let the people grow in grace. But at the same time, we need to recognize that we can drift, we can move away, we can move away from God's ideal. From the book Acts of the Apostles, page 29, it says, It is fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilizations of the 20th century, now the 21st. But the Word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old-time magicians. The ancient system of magic is, in reality, the same as what is now known as modern spiritualism. And you know, even in the 1800s and even the early 1900s, modern spiritualism was condemned by society and people, you know, even in the 1700s, 1600s, were burned at the stake for it. They were social outcasts. In the 1800s, they could be arrested. They weren't killed so much anymore, but they could be arrested. In the 1900s, it was tolerated. And in the late 1900s up till now, it's actually embraced and promoted and accepted in the norms of culture. She goes on, Satan is finding access to thousands by uh, minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends and in this day and age it's hundreds of millions the scriptures declare that the dead know nothing their thoughts their love have perished the dead do not hold communion with the living but true to his early cunning satan employs this device in order to gain control of what minds through spiritualism many of the sick bereaved the curious are communicating with evil spirits all who venture to do this are on dangerous ground the word of God, or the word of truth, declares how God regards them. <clears throat> Let's go on to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and we're going to take a look at a few verses here. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 24. It goes on. Now it happened as we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her master's much profit by fortune telling. You know, it's very interesting that that spiritualism is almost always connected to either gaining power and control over others or gaining what? Money. And we just looked at the previous example and now another example where the gain is money. And, uh, you know, for different people, it's different things. For some, it might be money. For others, it might be control. For others, it might be empowerment. For some, it might be escape from the real world. But this is what Paul was dealing with. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And, she, and he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities and they brought to them the magistrates and said these men <clears throat> being Jews exceedingly trouble our city 
And they teach us customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Isn't it very interesting? (laughs) They're trying to get rid of evil spirits, and they say they're teaching things that we do not believe in our custom. Now, if you notice something here, it's very interesting. And this is, this is kind of a microcosm of the end of time. You read the book Great Controversy, and it's very clear that the men of the city, because they were losing money, ar- they arrested Paul and Silas and drug them to the courts, and they said, these people are causing us what? Trouble. When in reality... They were the ones, through the practice of those things, that was bringing trouble to those people. They were binding them in sin, binding them in darkness, and they were the troublers. But they accuse who? Paul and Silas. Now what's interesting is that many years ago, you had a very clear picture of good and evil. When the movies first started, you have the white cowboy dressed in white and the cowboy dressed in black or gray or whatever, you know. And and the good guy was the good guy, the bad guy was the bad guy. And then over some time, you have this perception that sometimes the good guy can be bad. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You think the guy is good and at the end of the movie it shows, oh no, he was really the bad guy. Then over time, you had the place where the bad guy was begun to be perceived as good. Remember what I said, that evil was perceived as good or what was really bad was viewed as being victimized and really was something that was good. And you had that, right? And then you have what what we have in modern times we've evolved to is that that which is really good is perceived by the world as bad. And indeed, many of the traditional values of Christian America, now this is not, people get off on this stuff when they they talk about nationalism and all that stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking, and, and I could say a lot about that, but I won't, and nor will you pull it out of me. But I have a lot of opinions about it. But anyway, But just good core values based upon God and family and spirituality now in America, in America, are perceived as a threat to society. You look at the news. I mean, you'll find news articles perceived as a threat to society by many certain groups, okay? And I mean, look, I'm not going to get into this nationalism thing, but there's a difference between patriotism and nationalism okay to appreciate my country for the values that it holds that is perceived as social taboo today and i don't understand it you can't even verbally support a president in either direction without being slammed by the other side when did it become a sin to say i appreciate my president whoever he is it's ridiculous anyway we'll get off on that but Going back to the point, back to the scripture, amen? Here are these people trying to deliver this society from darkness and spiritualism, and the people view them as the problem. And that's exactly not just where we're headed, but where we are in today's society. Would you agree with that statement? It's true, and it's happening here. Uh, and then they put them in prison and gave a charge and so forth. And so what's interesting is that the men also, uh, you read on down in, in, I think that was actually chapter 8, forgive me, uh, I forgot about that, to mention that. But in chapter 8, uh, the same thing happens um, in the, uh, well, I don't know, it's either 16 or 8, I don't have time to look at it in this minute, as a side point anyway that when the, the, the guys who were making the little figurines of Diana the Ephesian, uh, they, they came about and they were very upset and they said they're costing us money and so forth. It's the same type of thing. All right, we're going to keep going because time is ticking. Now, Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. Notice what Paul says here. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are 
adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry. What does he say next? Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, and gone and on and on. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is God clear about this subject? I mean, like, it's not something to play with. It's not something to ponder about or wonder about. Or maybe he says this, but he doesn't really need it. He means something else. No, it's clear. Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. No question about it, okay? Go on, Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone and is the second death why is god so adamant about that again we've seen that it leads on a quick path to a dark place and god hates darkness for his people aren't you thankful today that we serve a god that wants you to walk in the light and you can always believe that you can always trust that the only thing you have to ever question is what's happening in the world today you never have to question the word of god do you you never have to question the spirit of prophecy, although there are plenty of people today who say you should. I vehemently disagree with them. Uh, but you never have to distrust those things. Uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Revelation 22, 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters who ever love and practice a lie. What is it, friends? It is a what? It is a lie. So I've had many people say to me throughout the time and they say uh, it's using magic to do good see that's the mantra today is we use white magic because there's white and black magic there's good and black and bad magic and if I do use white magic to do that which is good what what's wrong with that I mean if you follow the own inclinations of the human heart the human heart would say, that makes sense to me. I mean, we just want to do good. I mean, good is good, right? And there are many Christians today that excuse it. That's the mantra today. Uh, for movies or whatever, people are like, well, you know, it doesn't really do that much bad, so therefore it must be good. I mean, there's a program here, The Good Witch. <clears throat> I had a cousin when I was uh, in my late teens and she was practicing white wicca magic and uh, she defended it with that very reason or that very argument she said it's white magic and it's just doing good we want to do good for people but let me ask you a question today does the true biblical power of god do people good <laughs> why do you need something else you see what I'm saying? And so uh, for many, it's, it, it, many of those, they don't believe in God and they've embraced some other form of perceived good. But God is the one who is good. God is the one who is love, true or false. So when, whatever picture of love you're looking at, and you could look at a million different perceptions of love, if it's not from God, it is not really love. It is a perception of love, a false perception of love, because God doesn't define love, God doesn't know about love, God doesn't just merely express love, but God is love. That means every understanding of love connects back to Him. You see what I'm saying? And every perception of, of anything, of good, all stems back to Him, because He alone is good. And so anything outside of that... so. If, it, it, if somebody is using a method to attempt to do good on the earth that God does not approve of that method and God says that is aligned with the powers of darkness, then is there really any good that's coming out of that? No. It's the, it's the old-fashioned story that you know at the end of time the devil's going to inflict disease and then appear as Christ on the earth and withdraw that disease to make it appear good the appearance of good is not always good okay you have to understand that so the bible makes no distinction between white and black magic good or bad witches scripture condemns the use of it in any form or fashion 
and a person can accept that or they can reject that. But if you reject that, know that you are exiting God's ground and going on to another ground. That's just, it's just the simple truth. If I unplug from God A over here, the God of the Bible, and I say, you know, some of his things are good, but I don't like everything, so I'm just going to unplug myself. There's not a God number two to plug into. When you unplug from God, you unplug yourself from the life source, period. And you might have an existence, but you don't have life, okay? All right, let's go. I'm going to slip past. I'm going to, man, my thing is sticking here a little bit. And then it gets ahead of me here. It doesn't want to go on that text. I better read that text because it keeps clicking off of it. The Bible says in Colossians 2, I was going to skip it, but we're going to read it. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and building up in love, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. What does the Apostle Paul say? He says, beware lest anyone do what? Cheat you. Listen. If, I gave you a, if, if God gave you a key and He put a key in your hand and He said, as long as you possess that key, no matter what happens to you, you will have everlasting life. It's a golden key shining and glowing, right? And you hold on to that key and somebody comes along and they says, hey, you know, I have this thing. Would you like it? Looks good to me. The only thing you have to do is give me that key. And you say, not a chance in all the world, because this is my eternal life. And he says, look, like, you know, uh, you don't have to give it to me forever. I'm just gonna, I just want you to take a little sample, just have a little fun, and I'll give you your key back. Okay, because remember what we said the other day? You cannot receive something with a what? Closed hand. You have to open the hand. So you open the hand. He takes the key out. He places the trinket in your hand. You get a hold of it. You look at it, and you say, Wow. That's cool, but I'm feeling a little empty now. I'm done. I want my key back. What do you mean, your key? You gave it to me. It's mine now. Yeah, but you only said for just a minute. And, I, and they said, well, I, I now have the key, so I will determine how long I'm going to hang on to it. And by the way, I've decided I'm not going to ever let go of it like you foolishly did. You see what I'm saying? And then Jesus had to die to give that key back into our hands. Make sense? Let no one cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Nothing is more valuable than that key in your hand, which represents the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? Just, just an illustration there. All right. For in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. How many can say hallelujah for that? When Jesus died on the cross, he exposed the powers of darkness. He exposed those powers that are looking to bring darkness to the world. He exposed them, he made them known to the world, and he put an end to their power, except as you give them permission to do so. Satan has no power over us today except as we yield our wills to him and give him permission. I'm very thankful for that today. Amen? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Against all those things, there is no law. How many of you want those things to be prevailing power of your life? Love of Christ and the fruits of the Spirit. Now, let's go on. Acts chapter 19. This is the last main chapter we're going to look at here. And then we've got to move into our topic for today. Acts, this is a powerful one. I let, saved it until last. Acts chapter 19, verse 11. <clears throat> now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and the evil spirits went out from them. Then some of the itinerant Jew, extra, Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. What a, what a phrase to say. We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> That's like me going up to uh, the U.S. Senate and saying, 
I tell you, I'm telling you to pass this law in the name of the president. Who am I? You know what I'm saying? They didn't know Jesus. And the evil spirit answered and said, I, J- Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And then they leapt on them and prevailed against them, and so they fled. So the reality is, is that unless you have the power of Jesus in your heart, unless Christ is living within you, you can call out, people say, oh, well, if you're ever in trouble, just call out the name of Jesus. Well, I'm not saying God might not do something because a person is looking to Him in that moment, but there's something more powerful, and that is Jesus dwelling within you. Amen? The power of Christ within. Now, going on down here, uh, verse 17. This became known to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. I mean, say that's wonderful. Also, now watch this. Also, many of those who had practiced what? Magic brought their books together and did what? What did they do again? They burned them in the sight of all. And the, notice, notice it says that they burned them in the sight of all. In other words, they didn't do it privately because they wanted to have what? Accountability. As a witness to the others. See there? And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That was 2,000 years ago. How many of you would like to have in 2000, whatever the year is today, would like to have 50,000 pieces of silver? Would you like to have that? That's no small... In today's money, that's probably millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of millions. I don't know exactly, but it was a lot. And what were the people doing? They were spending their money on this thing. It amazes me that people will spend all their money on this kind of stuff, and then they say, well, I don't, I don't, I, I'm always broke. I, I don't have any money. And, and they're trying to get somebody to pay their power bill because they don't have money because they're spending money. Listen, people say, well, I, I couldn't return a tithe. Who wants to return a tithe? Every person in the world returns a faithful tithe. And a faithful offering. Everyone. The the lead warlock of the church of Satan today returns a tithe. It just depends on which God you're paying it to. Are you with me? Some people got a brand new bass boat out there. Six months of tithe. Some people live in a bigger, fancier house than they need paying tithe to their God. Some people are enchanted with all these little charms, returning a tithe to their God. You get my point? Now, what happened after they did this? What happened when they cleaned out the idols in their life and they burned the stuff that was separating them from God? Verse 20, So the Word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Let me tell you, it wasn't just growing mightily in the land. It wasn't just that more and more Christians were being uh, uh, preached to and, and, and baptized, although that was the case. But the Word of God grew and prevailed in their own hearts and in their own life. You see, sometimes we hit a ceiling and we become uninterested in spiritual things. My Bible begins to be boring Prayer seems mundane. And the reason is not because it is, but because I'm saturating my mind and my heart and my life with all these other things that are stagnating the growth of the Word of God in my own heart and in my own life, you see. Are you with me? And so we've got to consider what are those things in my life that are prevailing in me rather than the Word of God prevailing in me. Notice this statement. This is mind-blowing. Get in there. Messages to the Young People, page 275. When the Ephesians were converted, what is that word? 
You know, amazing things happen when you're converted. <laughs> Did you know that? And when you're reconverted every day, even more amazing things happen. When the Ephesians were converted, they changed their habits and practices. That is always a mark of conversion, is that the life begins to change. It becomes in harmony with the heart and the word of Jesus. Amen? Under the conviction of the Spirit of God, they acted with promptness and laid bare all the mysteries of the witchcraft. Why with promptness? Because if you don't act with promptness, I had a sister come up to me yesterday and say, I've been using different things that I know are not in harmony with God's Word after your talk today. I'm going home and I'm going to get rid of those. There's a danger if we don't act with promptness because it just creeps right back in. The Lord brings a burst of light into our life and scatters the darkness. But if we don't act promptly and start walking in that light right away, that darkness creeps back in and let me tell you a solemn truth, it doesn't take long. It gets darker, that's right. Laid bare all the mysteries of the witchcraft. They came and confessed and showed their deeds, and their souls are filled with holy indignation because they've been given such devotion to magic. Their hearts were indignant and indicted. They were, they were uh, full of indignation because they had given such devotion to magic and not to who? God, and had pro so prized the books which the rulers, uh, rules of Satan devising had laid down the methods whereby they might practice rich witchcraft. They were determined to turn from the service of the evil one. They brought their costly volumes and publicly burned them. Thus, they made manifest their sincerity and turning to God. The conversion of these Ephesians was attended with the results that always follow genuine conversion, when convinced that their magic books were false and percurnious, they were unwilling to sell them and thus place temptation in the way of others. 50,000 pieces of silver, and they said, we don't care. The power of God is greater than money. Don't sell that stuff. Burn it. They promptly burned the records of divination at a great personal sacrifice it's not really sacrifice i shouldn't have bought it in the first place amen so what am i losing nothing what am i gaining everything i'm losing nothing that jesus can't replace amen the power of truth triumphed over men's prejudices pursuits and love of money the book of of the ephesians committed to the flames on their conversion of the gospel they formally delighted in and permitted them to rule their consciousness and guide their minds. They might have sold them, but by doing so, the evil would have been perpetuated. They afterward abhorred the satanic mysteries, arts, and regarded with aversion the knowledge that they had obtained from them. I would ask the young who have been connected with the truth, have you burned your magic books? It's the same today. And the question is asked, have you burned your magic books? I remember when I was in third grade, third grade, and uh, I checked out for the first time a book called The Hobbit in my school library. I went to public school. I wasn't raised in the Adventist church. And I read that book, and it, let me tell you, I'll just, I'll just tell you, one of my weaknesses in my, in my past is medieval fantasy. There's young people here, and they're like, yep, I know exactly what you mean. Dungeons and dragons, elves, dwarves, wizards, dragons, knights, and I loved it. And if I, if I were to ever stray from the Lord, it'd be one of the first things I'd pick up again. I have to guard myself exquisitely. And I had all of the Lord of the Rings books, all the individual books, all the books in a series, all the books, and I voraciously read them, starting from third grade with The Hobbit. And I read all those books multiple times. And I just was enthralled by that stuff. And I remember when I came to the Lord, the Lord said, you need to get rid of that. And I did. I got rid of it. Because let me tell you, it, it, people are like, well, but I'm not blah, 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 blah. When you see the Lord Jesus as He really is, and you need to, if you don't understand Jesus like this, then you need to pray that He will give you a revelation of Himself. But when you see Jesus as He really is and the value that He has and the value He's placed on your life, there is absolutely no question, no question 
what you ought to do with anything related like that. Because Jesus is so much greater and so much more valuable. How many can say amen? Have you burned your magical books? Is the magic question today. Is there something in your house? A movie? A television series? A channel on your Roku? Or whatever you use, Apple TV? A video game? That you need to say, this is not God's will for me. I'll tell you that story another time. I'm going to go into our last piece today. Spiritualism and witchcraft and modern culture. I, f- I don't know if I'll finish. If I don't, I'll finish tomorrow. I'll say everything I need to say by the end of the week. Amen? But if I were to ask you today, how many of you like fresh squeezed orange juice? How many of you love it? Amen? If I were to say to you, Please do choose either one of these glasses to drink. How many of you think it looks great? It looks safe. But what you didn't know is that in one of those cups is one drop of venom from a king cobra. Which, by the way, one drop of venom from a king cobra is enough to kill three grown men. Three grown men. And I didn't tell you which cup it was in until after you drank it. How many of you would appreciate that? But it looks so what? Good, natural, and pure. What do you think about this guy? You know, my daughter has a stuffed animal of one of these, a loris. How many of you think he's just so cute? You know why his jaws puff out like that? Because he's got big, massive, nasty teeth that actually have neurotoxins. This is the only poisonous primate in the world. And if he bites you, you have an anaphylactic shock that takes over your body. But he looks so what? Cute and innocent. Amen? One thing I loved about Michigan is that there are no, except for the Makasala rattlesnake, but there's no other poisonous snakes here. No poisonous frogs that I know of. But what about, my kids used to just love, I mean, my son would walk in with like three garter snakes in his hand. I'm like, get those things out of here. And then like have a frog in every pocket, amen? I mean, it's great. But here you have this dark, how many things is just so cute? This is the most poisonous frog in the world and has enough neurotoxins to kill 20,000 mice. Those things which look sometimes pure, innocent, cute, and fun are not always that way. How many of you would agree? The Bible tells us, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, and so forth, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into what? Now, what are the good things about Satan? Nothing. Amen? Nothing. And he transforms himself into that which appears good. So naturally, his plan for the world would be to do so. The devil is a master at making what God condemns for good reason. Is there any good thing that God will withhold from those who love him? Any good thing? So if it's good, it's for you. Just like God said in the Garden of Eden, of every tree you may freely eat, except that one which is not good for you. So if you really trust and believe God, then you'll know that anything He gives you is good for you. Anything He forbids is not withholding from you. It is not good for you. True or false? How many of you think this young lady, she looks like a sweet young girl, doesn't she? Looks like almost even like an Adventist girl, like a nice girl that grew up in the church. 20-some years old, she killed her college roommate because she wouldn't perform some kind of sexual act with her. She killed her. Cut her throat, in fact. Cute and innocent, but a killer. Now, there's something called program non-response. How many of you have ever heard this? If you've ever taken a soul-winning class, you know what program non-response is. 
It, it, it's very simple. The, the word explains itself. You are programmed not to respond. And so back in the old days of film, you have this idea that, uh, well, it started off the cowboy in white, the cowboy in black, and the cowboy in white is going to overcome the guy in black because good always overcomes evil. And you know, they, uh, the movie's there, and he's chasing them all through the movie, and he eludes them. Then at the end, they have the gunfight. And back in the 50s or 60s, whatever it was, the very first death on screen, you know, you remember the old days, the old westerns, they'd shoot the guy, and there'd be this little red dot, you know what I'm talking about? About that big, and it's like, and everybody was like, <gasps> when I first saw that, <clears throat> and the guy was like, oh, you know, and he kind of fell very fake-like off his horse, and he was like, oh, and he died, and it was very silly, if you look at it today, but then a little bit later, the drop of blood got bigger, and then there was a hole, and you understand the point, until, and we progressed and progressed until today you have Hannibal, Le Hannibal Lecter, what's his name? Hannibal Lecter, did I say it right? Yeah, and he's sitting on the screen cooking a man's brain and eating it in front of the woman in the horror movie, and telling her he's about to eat hers. Yeah, my point is this. That in the very beginning, people were shocked by this. And then after a while, they settled down. And they show a little bit more. And they're a little bit shocked, but not quite as much. And you get more grotesque, but less shock. Until today, people can sit there and watch people doing all kinds of vile things. And they just sit there like this. And they don't think a thing about it. And then we've reached the place now in society where there's a man sitting right there, dying in front of me, and what do I do? Take myself a selfie with the man who's drowning in the pool and not bother to call 911. That's where we're at. That's what program non-response is. And so through time, the devil has been keen because he knew the course of society to introduce just a little at a time and a little at a time, okay? So let's see if I can get through this in nine minutes. I think I maybe can. How do you remember Fantasia at 1940? Who could argue with the cuteness of Mickey the Mouse? You know what I always say about Disney? It's a human trap set by a mouse. You like that one? So in Fantasia, here's Mickey, and he's a wizard. In the whole course of the movie, is his battle for evil set to classical music. And it's very innocent. There's all kinds of cute little features. You know, he, he casts spells to get the brooms to do his little work for him and all this thing. And then uh, over, you know, he's doing all these things. with That's his spell book that he's flying on. And then there's this bad evil guy that he fights at the end named uh, Chernobog. And he is a demon, actually. And here is Mickey using magic and all his spells and all his little little creatures that he brings to life to battle this thing of evil and gain the victory over him and in the end he wins good for mickey right but what is he doing he's using that which god says is already bad to battle a greater evil so then that which is not what God recommends is viewed as okay or even good. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Friends, that was back in 1940. Then you have the Adams Family coming out in 1960. I mean, just a, hum just a humorous comedy show. Maybe some of you have even watched this. But if you look at this, it's very interesting. You have a living vampire as the dad, a zombie as the butler, a witch as the mother and grandmother, and the uncle who is, um, I don't know, he's something. And, uh, and then you have the children who are kind of like the hybrids. And all these things, we're just making them simple, innocent, cute, and fun. And we have now modern uh, renditions of it. You can see it right there. 
and uh, even cartoons and so forth. And so we're making that which God condemns cute, innocent, and fun, and everybody accepts it. And then uh, the Christian world accepts it. And in today's age, I couldn't find an article speaking against some of this stuff from the Christian worldview. They all embrace it and support it and recommend it. And they say, we know that it teaches things that are not ideal. They said, but you just got to know the difference and talk to your kids about it. How, and, and they say this, they use this as an excuse. It's everywhere in the world, so you might as well just go ahead and, and do it and then just try to know the difference. How about we just don't do it? How about Philippians 4 a? whatever is true, noble, good, we meditate on those things and avoid those other things. Daniel didn't say, well, the food is set in front of me, I might as well eat it. He didn't say, I won't eat a whole meal, I'll just eat enough to satisfy them. He said, I'm not going to eat it. Oh, come on, bewitched. Making the witchcraft joyful, cute, and fun, right? I mean, so cute that all I got to do to cast a spell is twinkle my nose, right? The Bible makes no distinction between good and bad, does it? You know, even casting little spells to make people fall in love with me or, or just doing things for people's good. How about trusting in the power of God to do good on the earth? And not trying to look for another source of power outside of His because I'm not satisfied with what He does. Now this one is mind-blowing to me. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. In the 80s, man, I watched this movie, I don't know how many times as a kid. How many of you ever watched this as a kid, right? Seems absolutely innocent. And these people are on the way, they're traveling on the way, and if you notice, on a yellow brick road, what are the streets of this holy city made from? And they're traveling to a holy city. You know, that picture even looks like some of the pictures we use in evangelistic series of heaven. I'm traveling to this place where this man is, has the power to grant her the ability to go home. She left her home in that little whirlwind and the home was chaotic. It was full of, uh, and she gets transported to this land where it's supposed to be paradise. And she's going to the city to meet the Wizard of Oz. And when she gets there, oh, look, look at this picture on the yellow brick road. And what do you see over the city? What does that remind you of? It's of heaven. And when they actually get to the city, there's just a bunch of silly little characters that inhabit the city. Silly little munchkins. And then they have all this interaction with them and they sing a bunch of songs and then they're ushered into the Wizard of Oz. Remember that? And they see this face of, they see this hologram of a big face and they think, oh, it's like the face of God. And then they get in there and little Toto, the dog of Dorothy, jumps out of her arms and runs into behind the curtain where that little man is. You guys know the story, right? And do you remember what the man said in his booming voice? He says this. Ah, come on now. Yeah. No! Come on. Yeah, you know, the devil, he just loves to do his thing, doesn't he? There it is. He says, pay no attention to the little man behind the curtain. Remember? Because that man is behind the curtain and he's working all these controls to make it appear like he's this big, magical thing. And again, pay no attention to the little man where? Behind the curtain. Now, I want you to think about this. When you look at the heavenly sanctuary, come on now. Who's the man behind the curtain? In the heavenly city. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. The little man behind the curtain. Now you tell me, I, I mean, I'm either really ridiculous here or there's a connection. I mean, and I don't think it's hard to look at the, for the connection, right? 
I mean, somebody could say, oh, come on, that's just ridiculous. It's just a bunch of silly little fun. I don't think so. I just don't think so. And we're smart people here. We can figure that out. I used to watch He-Man, Masters of the Universe. Anybody ever watch that as a kid? And uh, I watched an episode. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched about five minutes of it just a few years ago because I thought, I, I wonder what my perception was as a kid versus now. I'm telling you, I watched five minutes of that thing and it was full of spiritualism. From the very beginning, he raises his sword in the intro and he says, I have the power. And he's standing in front of this skull-shaped castle and lightning comes down and transforms him into a hero. I'm just thinking, my word, that's very interesting. Then in the 90s, you also had Buffy the Vampire Slayer who, you know, she is the one killing the, the, those. And then what's interesting here is that Buffy is a young woman killing vampires, but then, and so she's killing the bad guys. But then a few years later, you had the episode of Twilight. How many of you have seen or heard of that? And in, in that series, the vampires are actually the good guys, and he brings the girl over into his, he be, makes her a vampire, and so the vampires are perceived as good. There's another show that was very popular, and uh, I had family members that would watch this, called Charmed, with the story of three sister witches, very beautiful, very attractive women, and if you notice the line down at the bottom, it says the power of what? The power of three. Now this is a phrase that they would say in the show. It says, I call upon you ancient power. Bring your powers to us sisters three. We want the power. Give us the power. The kiss of darkness forging your soul to mine. Now let me ask you, I mean like, is that just stuff that somebody's making up in their head? No. I mean, this stuff is serious. I mean, it is very serious. That show was in the 90s, but now there's a new show that's out. They've kind of remade it because it was so popular. And it, those, uh, those three girls are old, but now they have three new girls. And notice the top there. It says the power of three against the powers that be. Just mind-blowing. I mean, think about it. What's the power of three in the Bible? It's the Trinity. It's the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're imitating that very same thing and uh, with, through uh, a dark power. I'm going to talk about Harry Potter tomorrow, and I think this is probably uh, going to be a good place to stop. But friends, I'm just telling you, throughout the decades, the devil has gotten more and more blunt. He's gotten more and more bold. And he's saying things in videos today that would have never been said 20, 30 years ago. And it's very direct things. And what you find over and over again through the programs being released now, and I mean, look, I'm, I have a few more I'll show you tomorrow, but the ones I'm showing you, these are just very small examples. There's hundreds and hundreds of movies and television programs that have, all have this same focus to make the powers of darkness seem cute, interesting, and appealing. And why is he doing it? Because he's causing the people of earth to become sympathetic with his cause. Sympathetic with his side. And he is literally conditioning the world in preparation for the very last deceptions that were told about in Revelation in the book Great Controversy where he and his evil angels will appear on the earth as loved ones that have been lost will appear as the apostles of Christ. And ultimately, the greatest one will be when Satan manifests himself on the earth as Christ himself. And he is caught, he's preparing the world for this. Some of the stuff, I didn't even get to the, to the more serious stuff. We'll do that tomorrow. But I'm telling you, like, you look at some of these movies on zombies and you read Revelation 20. He's preparing and conditioning the world. He's softening the world to his cause. They're becoming sympathetic with him so that he'll be readily received when he does come with that master deception. Friends, I'm telling you, you got to study the Word of God. What do you do if you've, been, if you've got some of this stuff? What do you ought to do with it? You ought, to, you ought to follow the example of the Ephesians, amen? You ought to get rid of it. You ought to delete it. You ought to burn it. You ought to do whatever you need to do to get rid of it. And let me tell you, 
There are endless things that God will replace those things with that are joyful, that are pure, that are holy. I'm telling you, I never had so much fun in my life as when I became a Christian and put away that stuff. And uh, you know, I used to watch those things, and it's stimulating while you're watching, but at the end of it, you feel empty and you feel uh, really kind of drained. But the things that God has for us bring life, amen? I know you want to have life today. So we're going to continue this tomorrow. Uh, spiritualism and popular culture in modern day times in the media that we're watching and hopefully by the grace of God we'll gain the victory over this. What do you say? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank You so much for this time together. We look forward to tomorrow. Where we'll be able to uh, examine even more of these things and even pieces of theology. That will be our last topic that are getting um, strewn with spiritualism. And we pray today that Your hand would guide us, that You would give us boldness, You would give us an extra portion of Your Spirit to guard us against these things in the last days, and that we'd have the boldness to say no, to seek out Your will for our lives, and the desire and the sur willingness to surrender our lives to You. So bless each one, I pray. And Lord, may we make the decision that we need to make today to get rid of those magic things, and to turn our whole minds, our whole hearts to the resurrection power of Christ. That's what we want. That's what we plead for. And we ask Your blessing here today. In Jesus' name, Amen.